Unbeliever surprise and slander. Verse 4. Unbelievers no doubt find it strange that you do not rush to engage with them in such excessive carousing of this sort in the same way they do, and they slander your good name as a result. 1 Peter 4.4 4. Most believers have probably had the experience of secular acquaintances, relatives or contacts at work, expressing amazement at our unwillingness to involve ourselves in various behaviours common among unbelievers from which we distance ourselves out of our fear of the Lord. Perhaps it is that we do not gossip, or that we do not take the Lord's name in vain, or that we do not drink to excess at the office Christmas party, or that we stay away from flirtation. Add to that positive comments we may make about God and the Bible, and it really is not surprising that we are often treated like pariahs. More than that, we are often looked down upon as those who must assume that we are holier than thou, as those in our circuit take offence at our good behaviour and at our staying away from bad behaviour. Both tendencies are surprising to unbelievers, who are most often content to follow the crowd, especially because swimming against the current is both difficult and inviting of unwanted negative attention. Thus it can also seem to them, possibly only because in their heart of hearts even unbelievers recognize the folly of their ways, that by refusing to rush to engage with them in such excessive carousing, we are judging them as somehow inferior to ourselves. While it is true that many legalistic, and thus by definition immature believers do indeed have, and often gratuitously share, that judgmental attitude, this is not what Peter is referring to here. Instead, Peter is referencing the surprise and inevitable unpleasant response of unbelievers who take offence at our different approach, not because we verbally judge them or overtly express superiority of our behaviour over theirs. Mature believers want only to be left alone and for others to come to the truth that we know to be true, but because they interpret our good behaviour as a subtle attack on their bad behaviour, as irrational as that may seem. This makes them uncomfortable for one reason because it causes unbelievers to have to examine their underlying assumptions about life. And nothing is more uncomfortable for an unbeliever than the prospect of scrutiny from the actual judge, that is, of God's eventual judgment, especially for those who are determined not to change. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Acts chapter 24 verse 25 Thus the goodness which believers should manifest as a matter of course will leave our unbelieving acquaintances with no legitimate charges to bring against us. Titus chapter 2 verse 8 And for unbelievers in our ambit, who have not yet hardened their hearts against the truth, the witness we provide in not only staying away from outrageous behaviour, but also living good, respectable lives, honouring to the Lord, and without any discernible excessive worldly ambitions, may possibly lead them to have a change of heart, as Peter has explained before. Keep your manner of life among the Gentiles, that is, unbelievers, morally good, so that although they slander you as evildoers, yet when they look upon your good works, that is, life and production, they may yet give glory to God on the day of visitation. 1 Peter 2.12 But for those who are determined not to find fault with themselves, it is a function of human nature to cast blame upon others, and we may thus expect to be slandered on account of doing what is right. Such undeserved slander may sting. No one wants to be spoken ill of. But we who entrust ourselves to the Lord in all things have nothing in fact to fear of such unwarranted criticism. In the end, all such unfair defamation will not be allowed to harm us. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 Give an account, verse 5. But they are going to have to give an account for all this to the one who stands ready to judge the living, that is, you believers, and the dead, that is, the unbelievers who oppose you. 1 Peter 4.5 for those who oppose us and slander us unjustly, believers need always to keep firmly in mind that we are not to become overly upset, nor to take issues into our own hands.
Our judge is in heaven, and he will see to our vindication, Romans chapter 12, verse 19. But we will be blessed in spite of all opposition, and indeed on account of it. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 11 and 12 Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil, for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Luke chapter 6 verse 22 and 23 Those who oppose us, those who attack us and slander us for Christ's sake on account of the fact that we are believers doing what is right, will face divine judgment. At the last judgment, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, literally lot-blamers, walking according to their own lusts. Jude chapter 1 verse 14 through 16 At the second advent These tribulations which you are enduring are evidence of the righteous judgment of God in His judging you to be worthy of His kingdom, on behalf of which you are also suffering. Since indeed it is just for God to repay with tribulation those who are subjecting you to tribulation, and to give you who are being distressed relief along with us at the revelation of our Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels, wreaking vengeance in a flame of fire upon those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power, when he comes on that great day to be glorified in the midst of his saints, that is, resurrected believers, and to be marveled at among all those who have believed, as our testimony has been believed in your case. 2 Thessalonians 1 6 through 10. And will be frustrated in all of their attempts against us in this life as well. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17. Gospel proclaimed to the dead, verse 6. For it is for this very reason that the gospel has been proclaimed to the spiritually dead as well as to you, in order that they too, after they have been convicted in the flesh according to their human conduct, might live by means of the Spirit according to God's grace. 1 Peter 4, 6. The very reason for the proclamation of the gospel to unbelievers, the spiritually dead, is on account of the judgment mentioned in the previous verse. Destruction and condemnation of unbelievers is the last thing God wants. God the Father wants all to be saved, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 23 and John chapter 12 verse 47, and Jesus Christ has already paid the entire price, a very steep price indeed, for all of their sins, so that they might be saved, Romans chapter 5 verse 18 and 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. Peter's hope, expressed here in the Spirit, is that all unbelievers might be convicted in the flesh according to their human conduct, that is, brought to see, through observing us as well as through God's direct intervention in their lives, that their behavior merits only death, so that they might turn to Jesus Christ and be saved, gaining life eternal, by means of the Spirit according to God's grace, through responding to the truth of the gospel. Before our Lord's return, that gospel will be proclaimed to all, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. But in spite of God's desire, and in spite of our efforts on behalf of the gospel, in the witness of words, and also the witness of our lives, only those who deign to respond to God's grace in the gift of Jesus Christ will be saved. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. John chapter 3 verse 18. 